Can you hear me? Is that better? <laughs> okay. Uh, good afternoon and welcome uh, to the end of another long day. But hopefully, we're going to make this a really great conversation uh, to be really interactive. We're going to have more of trying to think together rather than people just speaking at you. And, um, and hopefully you're in the right room. We're here to talk about growing a new cadre of tech diplomats. I'm Melanie Garson. I'm the Cyber Policy Lead and Acting Director at the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change. Um, for those who don't know, Tony Blair Institute, uh, we work in uh, nearly 30 countries globally, uh, working to support leaders with practical policy solutions and uh, to some of the world's biggest challenges, including uh, things related to the internet. We're also um, co-hosting this panel with um, CEPS, um, which, <laughs> which was, I didn't like that someone, uh, that didn't, uh, was established in 1983 as a leading think tank and forum uh, for debate on EU affairs based in Brussels. And I have uh, Rosanna Fanny here who uh, is uh, specializes in uh, AI governance and the impact on uh, I IR as part of this panel. So today, uh, we're really trying to bring together some thinking about um, last year we at TBI we launched um, a leader's guide to tech forward foreign policy and really spring boarding off a report that we wrote about the open internet being on the brink and really showing this clear need for countries to be able to have a glib a picture of the whole ecosystem of global challenges to be able to solve them. And as was said this morning, the internet that we see before us is not actually you know, quite the internet that the founders really imagined. And it's sort of become with so many moving parts that within foreign policy, it's been very challenging for countries to find the right way to be able to interact holistically across those moving parts. And what we're seeing is the increased need for well, that tech is affecting everything from security and defense to humanitarian delivery, but that it's not necessarily being unified from foreign policy capacities. So we call for this uh, need for countries to embed tech into their foreign policy for greater anticipatory awareness, for coordinated policy visions, for strategic and clear strategic vision. Um, this month, Diplo brought out a great report re reviewing the situation on tech diplomacy in Africa in particular. And looking at still how less than half the countries in uh, Africa really bring up digital issues onto the UN agenda. So it's, uh, they're increasingly becoming torn between EU, US versus China visions of where to sit on the proposals of governance of the internet. And so what we wanted to do with this session was bring together some thinking on where, what is the impact of having a tech diplomat for different uh, countries and really, and then come together and think about what would be the best practice or ideas or lessons to overcome the obstacles so that we can build a new cadre of tech diplomats to have their voice on the stage. So to do this, we brought together Professor Andre Shreve, who was uh, Malta's uh, first diplomat, uh, tech diplomat or appointed or did diplomat Ambassador for Digital Affairs, formally appointed in 2020. Uh, we also have Sinit uh, Zou from uh, the Tony Blair Institute, uh, who has led digital transformation work dreams both here in Ethiopia and has been engaged in working across uh, sub Saharan Africa on digital issues since 2007. Uh, we were supposed to be joined by Andrea Renda, who was going to give us the Latin American viewpoint. And uh, he, but we also have uh, Dal Delo, also from the head of tech for TBI in Senegal with a background in tech development and really working with uh, government uh, ministries uh, in Senegal across uh, thinking about this issue about where tech should sit with foreign policy. And most of all, we have everyone here in the room. So anyone here a tech diplomat as well? 
That's right, excellent. Oh, anyone part of a tech diplomatic capacity? Anyone engaged with tech diplomats? Excellent. So we're going to want all your viewpoints as well. So uh, without any further ado, I'm going to uh, turn over to Andre. And Andre, are you there? Oh, I can't. actually, we have a <laughs> slide from uh, Rosanna as well. So if you just sort of, if you have a minute before we go to you, Andre, to just go to slido.com and answer the very first question that she has there. And you can also put any of your questions that you have on Slido. It's not working. Yep. No, but that is an interesting question. <laughs> we were just debating that at lunch, in fact, quite clearly about what about medicine. We'll come back to that. Um, okay, so without further ado, um, I'd like to turn over to Andre. And Andre, really, what I want to um, ask you, we're so sorry you're not here in the room with us, is um, from your experience of being a small country, what has having representation as a digital ambassador really brought to shaping your foreign policy, shaping your interactions on the global stage, and what difference has it made? Thank you. Sure, thank you, and uh, I'm, I'm sorry for not being able to be present. It's uh, lots of commitments, family and everything else made it impossible for me to be there. But still, uh, thank you, uh, thank you everyone for, for, for the invite, uh, Tony Blair Institute, of course, Melly and Rosanna for setting all of this up. And I'm really happy to see such an interesting, um, uh, such a large crowd um, 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 following the proceedings live. And to the one person who raised his hand or her hand, as being the the one tech diplomat in the room, you yeah. know. Let's hope that by IGF eighteen there'll be more more in the room who can who can raise their arm uh, in answer to that question. Um, so uh, yes, Melanie, it's it's a very important question, and and I, I'm very proud to have, sort of have this opportunity to to be you know Malta's first uh, tech, tech diplomat. Hopefully not the last, of course. Uh, but I, I am one of a growing class of of, of tech diplomats. But let, let's let's talk about the question that you raised about small states and maybe broaden that um, a bit. Now, one of the key points I I often make about us small states is is agility. So, you know, being small can be a hindrance. But on the other hand, being small allows you to change tack and change uh, change direction rather rapidly, and that makes us, in general, um, a natural place to natural places to think about new regulations, new governance structures, and incorporations of new, incorporation of new technologies into our into our country before larger states. And in some sense, this gives us experience of how these technologies, how these ideas work before others, which allows us to, again, take leadership positions um, in the discussion. Of course, we need to try and take those positions, but we are naturally placed in many, in many places to, 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 to take those, uh, those leadership roles. And, um, and it's not just small states, of course. Um, uh, one of the, in one of the preliminary discussions we had, uh, there was also this issue of you know, the global north versus the global south, which is a big, a big part of um, uh, the tech discussion. And what counts for small states also counts for, for the global south in the sense, that is to say, um, we are seen as laggards occasionally when it comes to taking up new technologies and so on. But rather than seeing it as a problem, you know, in a sort of deficit mentality uh, perspective, I'd like to see it as an opportunity. And if you think about technologies like peer-to-peer -peer mobile banking, you know, Africa is the pioneer there. So again, there's a lot we can learn uh, from Africa in this particular space, which allows us to think about how to regulate, how to govern this aspect of technology. And more broadly, this is what I'm trying to say, small states like the global south, like other places, have a, a, a particularly interesting, particularly good role to play if, if 
we take the initiative to try and assert leadership in certain in certain uh, in certain fora and i guess this is the important point then um we also need to find kind of put our foot forward uh best foot forward and try and take try and assert leadership um, in the right fora you know we need to be around the table um uh, uh in all of these discussions and you know there is there is precedent for this uh, there's a couple of precedents uh, you know which i can think about off the top of my head i mean one of is one of these is uh, the recent uh, international discussion sparked about the uh, climate catastrophe, which was sparked in part by small island states saying this represents an, inter- um, an existential threat to us. We need to do something about this. And closer to home, um, a few decades ago, Malta was the one that spearheaded the, the law of the seas uh, at the United Nations. So there is precedent for small states um, globally taking leadership roles. and. In the technology, in the world of technology, this could also be another front for us to, to do this. And of course, we need uh, we need uh, tech diplomats to be able to participate in the conversation and, as I'm saying, assert leadership there. Perfect. Thank you so much, Andre. And I'm sure we'll come back to you if uh, people have questions uh, for you. But I'd like to now give the floor over to Sunit. So, Sunit, although Clearly, you couldn't have been working since 2007, of course. <laughs> I don't make you a small child. <laughs> but um, with all your experience, what do you think is missing uh, with Africa's engagement in tech diplomacy? And how do you feel that, in fact, we can close that gap? And what would it take to build a cadre of tech diplomats? Thanks, Melanie. Hi, everybody. Can everybody hear me? Fantastic. Okay. So I think I'll, I'll invite everybody to take a step back first and kind of s- uh, invite us to consider two lenses to, to think about where Africa sits in, the, in this kind of big global uh, tech diplomatic world that is emerging. So I think the first lens that is an interesting one is a kind of neo-Cold War that appears to be emerging and playing out on the continent. Um, and then on one side, and you know, I'll preface this by saying that I- I'm using country names as a shorthand, but obviously respecting that policies and governments and people are not homogenous. But on the one hand, you sort of have the China, Russia positioning and their allies versus the kind of US, EU um, and their respective allies. Um, and I think one of the interesting things about the n- neo-Cold War playing out is it brings tech policy to the forefront only at periods of crisis. And I think the lesson to, that we should be taking away from, from those moments of crisis is let's not wait for the crisis. We have to take a proactive approach. And I think that's what I would invite all governments to do, but particularly African governments. Um, I think the second interesting lens is the kind of the rise of the uh, multinational corporation versus the power of the nation state and other multilateral governments. Um, So we see big players, obviously, like Alibaba, Google, Apple, Huawei, Oracle, uh, the list goes on, kind of at at odds with governments at various kind of issues, whether that's around tax, um, tax, uh, tax revenue, whether that's around employment rights, whether that's around um, thinking about, again, kind of uh, uh, periods of elections and social media content, you kind of see this tension playing out in that lens. So... Both lenses tempt you to see Africa, I think, as passive or victimized. Um, And I would challenge that narrative. Uh, And what I'll do is I'll just go through a flavor of kind of the top spaces where tech diplomacy might play out, thinking about these lenses. So the first one is cybersecurity. Um, We have the AU Convention on Cybersecurity and Data Privacy. We've made a first step, but the sign up to it, the kind of follow through is still very limited. Um, thinking about our kind of next dimension around e-commerce and trade. We have the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. There's a lot of talk about Africa being the single digital market. Um, I think also it's it's very interesting that the Central African Republic has accepted cryptocurrency as a legitimate um, currency. We see Nigeria um, launching its uh, central, its own CBDC, the e-Naira, limited success, I think there's a lot of, uh, these are big complex issues that I'm, I'm touching upon. But one of the important things around e-commerce and trade is 
given the youth dividend and the huge kind of unemployment that many African countries face, we know that the gig economy is hugely important on the continent. These, the gig economy is dominated by, again, major multinational corporations, and it raises lots of issues for African governments around protecting employee rights, around taxation, um, around the, the role that education has got to play to prepare the African youth, and frankly, all Africans, because we're, we're all having to learn all the time now. Um, so I think thinking about the legislation and thinking about planning is also really important, again, in that space of tech diplomacy. Infrastructure. I think the infrastructure conversation in Africa focuses on connect connectivity, 5G power, access to devices. All of these things demand engagement with foreign powers, whether they be corporations or whether they be governments. Um, and then the final one, which is also very important, around, is around social norms and governance. Um, we've had l various pockets of debate. Uh, they typically are isolated, um, whether they're around what are acceptable things to say on the internet, whether that's around what is the role of social media platforms on elections. All of these things, again, demand a coherent and holistic view, not just at a national level, but a, at a regional level. So keeping all of those kind of big flavor issues in mind, what I would say is, at the Tony Blair Institute, we always say all policy is tech policy. And I think if you're gonna walk away with one thing from, from our talk, that's what I would invite you to walk away with. Um, I would say on Af in Africa, when it comes to tech diplomacy issues, uh, it's very varied. There's a lot of stuff that we're making proactive steps on. Uh, I've mentioned a few of them. I think another one to mention, um, that worth mentioning, is the Africa uh, Declaration on Internet Rights. We've, there are things on paper the translation on the ground is there's still a long, long journey to go. So one thing is tech policy requires Africa and all governments to be proactive. We need to see tech on a par with uh, energy, military capacity, food security when it comes to thinking about the role of technology and tech diplomats in foreign policy. We have to commit to upskilling both at individual level um, but also in terms of leveraging and upskilling important forums like the African Union, like the UNECA, including regional bodies like IGAD. I think the third thing is we have to, we have to be a lot more united on these fronts. Um, we don't have to agree on everything. We're not a homogenous entity, but we've got to identify where we've got partners and where we're going to have to kind of fight a battle. And I think being open and clear about that allows you to have a foreign policy strategy that will be much more effective and will help you identify the assets that you can leverage. Um, and then the final thing is, I think s speaking also to, to the point that my predecessor made, this stuff being nascent works to this continent's advantage. Um, it's not just about being big or small, but it's also about being at an early stage. Uh, and, and I think Africa is in a really good position if it's able to, to get ahead of the curve and then let's n let in lessons from kind of previous global battles, uh, whether that's around commodities or security, um, we don't have to repeat those mistakes. So I'll stop there. Thanks, Melanie. Thank you, Sini. And I'm sure that's also triggered a bunch of questions. And we're seeing co some coming in through on Slido. You can still feed into the Slido poll. If you go to it, it should be working now. You just have to tick on the section that says polls and give us uh, your ideas. But I'd like to now call upon Dalda. I don't know why I'm looking up on the screen, but <laughs> it should be. seems like a natural thing to do. Uh, Dalda, uh, joining us from uh, Senegal. And again, we're sorry. Uh, that you can't be with us today. But um, are you there? Can you hear us? Yes, I lost you for a bit, but yeah, I'm hearing you very well. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, thank you, Dada. So really what I'd like to um, do is get some of your thoughts on the challenges uh, from Senegal, both that uh, where you're engaging with tech diplomacy and what is needed to help you build sort of a better tech diplomacy capacity within Senegal. Thank you, Melanie. Uh, I would love it to be with you today, but um, the first thing for Senegal, the, the chance we have is that we have a president who is an engineer, that's the first thing. Um, and the second is he's the first tech diplomat without you know having the official title. 
By that I mean, uh, because tech is very high the agenda for Senegal, um, we are, um, he is trying on any international gathering to just push for the digital agenda in Senegal. So I think that's the first role he's playing in the in, in, the, in that field. Um, so uh, Senegal is a bit of a particular country, which is that we are a, a very a true democracy and at the same time surrounded with countries that are a bit unstable. So we are moving uh, on that field alone. And at the same time, because we are part of the uh, the kind of REC, also the regional economic community, community like ECOWAS, we are moving on with one heart as a um, you know, sovereign country. And then at the same time, we're trying to uh, you know, uh, on the ECOWAS uh, side, pushing the agenda on everything uh, around policy, et cetera. So um, uh, well, just one example, um, we have been a uh, member of the GPI, which is the Global Partnership for Artificial Intelligence since two days ago. Uh, this is uh, one thing that Tony Blair Institute has really uh, was leading uh, since last year. And now Senegal has, uh, has joined other member of OECD um, as member of the Global Partnership for Intellig uh, Artificial Intelligence, which is a big achievement for that country because it's like-minded uh, countries. Uh, we, uh, we were able to push that, uh, you know, to, to, to put that one over the, over the line. Uh, the, the second thing uh, maybe that I want to discuss is around um, the, 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 the data governance and how a country like Senegal is trying to push. Um, so it's, again, uh, tech diplomacy because, uh, because it's a stable country, again, uh, that we have some infrastructure like data centers that we're trying to build. Uh, we are pushing, it's not a tech diplomat, you know, traveling around the country, the surrounding countries, uh, trying to convince them to host their data within us. But it's just uh, either the Ministry of Digital Economy or the Digital Agency who travel to the Gambia, who is very our neighbor, to Mali or uh, Guinea, and then try to sell these ideas of this idea, sorry, of digital, uh, of data embassy, where we say, listen, it's uh, the same ECOWAS region, again, uh, you better host your data within uh, Senegal infrastructure rather than going to the US or or Europe to, to host them. That's that's one of the uh, things uh, that we are seeing playing uh, uh, in, um, uh, in the fields. Uh, the, other uh, maybe uh, uh, the, the last subject that I want to touch uh, is um, around how uh, we can, uh, you know, uh, it's not kind of piggybacking, but how we can, uh, as a small and agile country, uh, try to frame and put a conversation between uh, Senegal and, and, and big tech. And we are seeing that in a very vivid and uh, concrete example of how we are convincing a partner like Oracle to come to Senegal and then um, uh, set up a, 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 the, the, a sovereign cloud. So this is uh, something, again, that Tony Blair Institute is trying to, to push, uh, where we say to uh, a big tech like uh, Oracle, this is a problem for many countries who want their data to be uh, within boundaries. So uh, the residency of data, how could you help us do it? You're making a case. We are an exemplar country. So if it works for us, it could work for 54 countries in Africa. So I'm just going to uh, just stop there, but yes, it's kind of legacy, uh, sorry, uh, uh, regulations around data, but it's a, a, also some concrete implementation of how uh, Senegal can, you know, uh, at least try to uh, converse and uh, talk with uh, big tech and, uh, you know, have some kind of uh, positive out output uh, out of it.
Thank you so much, Dalda. And um, before we turn, and if any of our speakers, so Andre, Dalda, if you want to jump in at any point, please uh, alert Rosanna and we'll turn over uh, the floor back to you. And uh, you can just nudge me. <laughs> but, uh, we have a whole bunch of questions that have uh, come in thick and fast. Um, and so I'm just going to, and I'm going to jump off the first one because I think it's a really interesting one, is that we didn't actually define what we meant by tech diplomacy and someone said, well, what do we mean by tech diplomacy? And I'm more than, I'm happy to give what how we perceived it as our definition in the paper and then more than open to if anyone wants to add or change or <laughs> respond uh, to that. But And I think there is a distinction between e-diplomacy and tech diplomacy with e-diplomacy being the extent that you use sort of social media or tech as part of uh, your messaging in and tech diplomacy similarly in the same that we think of climate diplomacy or any other sort of diplomacy in the sense that it's partly how you're engaging with the whole range of actors uh, across any given issue, in this case tech, to be able to shape and formulate the conversation, advance your interests, and and see the change or be part of the change that you want to see both locally, nationally, regionally, and globally. So that would be whether that is, and I think uh, Dada raised an, uh, an important point that it's in today's day and age, both engaging with other states and with the international forum, being able to have uh, your voice heard alongside and cooperating, collaborating for that, as well as with tech companies that are increasingly taking on roles as geopolitical actors, whether that's in stabilizing the internet or in their uh, formulation or of tech and how we're using it. So that would be where I put the definition at, but I'm happy for anyone else, Andre or anyone in the room that would like to add to that definition. Thank you very much. Um, um, now maybe offer um, an add to the definition, but maybe um, a framework for it. Um, you know, not too long ago, about um, two weeks ago, there was a conference in Malta actually um, called Digital Diplomacy and Governance, and I had the pleasure to participate in that. And um, to some extent, we identified three elements or components of digital diplomacy, one of which that you mentioned. And that is that first is the impact of basically information communication technology on the geopolitical um, environment or basically on the environment in which diplomacy acts. And then, um, and then, so that will be the environment. And then issues, so as you said, there are tech issues and ICT related issues that a diplomat, a modern diplomat now has to face. And then ICT as tools, so the tools that diplomat would use to reach out to a bigger um, 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 audience and, um, and constituency. And probably that framework of those three points can help us to see either the definitions of each or the overlap between them, digital diplomacy, e-diplomacy, and um, uh, tech diplomacy um, um, alike. For me, I'd like to also bring back that many of these issues were, were tackled quite a few years ago, 2003, 2005, the uh, two phases of the whistles, in which the first fusion between the tech community and as modern or as new as it could look like, and the and the diplomacy as traditional and as old as it could look like, the two, uh, the two communities met and I was uh, happy enough to be one of, um, uh, one of those members participating in the, two, in the two phases of the summit. So I think it's very useful to have that, um, that look into the history as well to see how to build into the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, may I get your name? <laughs> um, my name is Amr al I'm um, a diplomat, uh, but currently at the African Union Commission. Perfect. Thank you. Well, thank you for uh, sharing that uh, with us. Um, and uh, I think, Andre, you wanted to add into that. So, um, Andre? Uh, yes, and I, and I, I had not recognized my, my, my the previous speaker, but I, we probably interacted in Malta a couple of weeks ago, so uh, hi. Um, uh, yes, yes, I mean, uh, um, there's, there's a few different ways in which one can spin this, uh, this idea of, you know, what really is tech diplomacy. Um, 
One is, as has been said right now, which is you know, there's you know, tech as a topic, tech as a tool, and tech as an environment for doing diplomacy. Uh, my preferred way, because I come from science as my background, my preferred way is actually to piggyback off of the um, a definition for science diplomacy, which was given a few years ago by the Royal Society and the AAAS. Uh, but you know, change a few words, and that is this tech for diplomacy, which you just called e-diplomacy a few minutes ago, and that is basically using technology as a tool to help us engage diplomatically. Now, this is particularly important for small countries, perhaps also for those reason, regions which don't have a very large diplomatic footprint in general. But particularly as a small country, we don't have the resources to engage diplomatically um, in the same way as, for example, the US has. Uh, so by using digital tools in just the right way, we can grow our diplomatic footprint. And one can call that sort of tech for diplomacy or e-diplomacy. Uh, there's also the idea of diplomacy for tech. Where here we're talking about using diplomatic means, diplomatic channels, multi-stakeholder fora uh, to discuss the issue of governing technologies, uh, perhaps also somehow through diplomacy encouraging the growth of technology, uh, encouraging the, 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 the development of technology. And here I want to uh, want to echo some of the concerns raised by both Summit and Dauda, and that is kind of the interesting place that we find ourselves in at the moment in the global world, where there are, where there are the, the large multinational corporations that really, and here I'm going to put on my small ha uh, small country hat, they have much more power in every sense of the word than, than small countries. And that makes it very difficult for us as small countries to interact with them. There is, yes, the aspect of, of, of encouraging them to invest in us, which is one way. But also when it comes to uh, discussing, uh, for example, issues that we face or, or trying to talk about governance, the structures are not obvious. How do we go about going to these multinational corporations, sitting around on a table uh, around a table with them, and discussing ways forward when it comes to governance? So there are some issues there which kind of go a bit beyond the traditional uh, diplomatic framework. And then there is tech in diplomacy. Uh, so that is using technology to inform diplomacy, diplomatic relations to somehow make diplomatic relations smoother. And I would kind of bring in perhaps uh, Meta's uh, Cicero software, you know, that sort of idea, uh, as using tech to somehow enhance how states in, um, interact diplomatically with one another. Um, so that's just a slightly different way of, of phrasing, you know, these three pillars. Uh, but it's my preferred way of, of defining tech diplomacy, you know, so in three, these, using th these three different lenses. Thank you so much. Well, that's uh, definitely added. I hope that answered the question of the person uh, that asked it. Sadiq, did you want to add into that? <laughs> yeah, it's all uh, great. So I think, um, again, turning uh, back to uh, some of the questions, and if there are any questions in the room other than the ones I got on Slido, please uh, raise your hand um, and sort of... Add and as you are, or if you put them into Slido, uh, then so it be it. Uh, so we've had a question uh, also here from Paul, who said, to what extent should uh, tech diplomacy come from the foreign ministry or should it become to other bodies? And and I think this is something that we were looking at and, and part of the advocacy of the paper we did was to sort of actually say this, it should be embedded in foreign policy. And I think uh, Chris Blinken said it recently when the US only last year or this year put in tech into their foreign policy to say he was always bringing in scientists and technologists to tell him what he needed to know and that this needs to be embedded into uh, the foreign policy capacity. And I think as uh, Sunit alluded to, that it's so that there, the gaps aren't, so there's so many missing gaps if uh, it's left to either different ministries to each try and work out their bit of tech, that things are falling through the cracks. And from our perspective, that's where we see actually the fragmentation of the internet potentially happening because if, for the, your traditional diplomats don't realize what trade, you know, the Department of Trade may be doing on various standards and how that can be impacting onto the wider internet ecosystem or something else within the whole tech ecosystem, then that's when the system's beginning to break up for countries a little. Um, I see Sunit might want <laughs> to add something here. No, I'm, I mean, I agree with you. I think typically the big players tend to be the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, um, 
and then Ministry of Defence for security issues, um, and then Ministry of Finance, and then the Head of State offices. Um, and the Ministry of ICT, I think it's, it's has, probably in every country, has experienced an interesting journey from kind of being the kind of back-end IT guy um, <laughs> the, and then suddenly, like periodically, they're sort of thrust to the, you know, like limelight because th there's been a crisis or a kind of critical issue. So I think there's an interesting question about the role of the Ministry of ICT or Innovation and Tech specifically in the mix. Um, what tech diplomacy demands that uh, is a is a greater need for collaboration, um, which governments internally and kind of in terms of internal comms are not always great at. Um, and that challenge is further compounded by the fact that the nature of tech, diplom dipl tech diplomacy issues are international in their nature. So not only do you have to speak to all the key people in your own country, you've got to speak to all the key people sort of in other countries. And then further, it all changes really, 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 really fast. The tech changes fast, um, things are moving at a much faster pace, and again, I think governments typically are, are going to struggle or have struggled in the past with keeping um, up to speed with this stuff, particularly when it comes to translating a kind of initial announcement to regulation and then rollout, et cetera, et cetera. And I think where that really matters is in issues that impact particularly vulnerable communities. Um, and my, my, my thinking is, f just from a moral perspective, that also has to be in the mix. Um, so we're not just trying to challenge the kind of big powers that be, but thinking about, well, there are lots of people who aren't going to be in the room to represent their interests. So embedded um, and mainstreamed across that is, what does this mean for the poorest? What does this mean for the vulnerable? What does this mean for communities that are disproportionately impacted? Again, going back, I think, to resonating with the earlier point um, on the impact of climate change and how that has forced a kind of coalition of small island bodies um, to get together. I think, we'll I would hope to see something like that for, for tech policy. Thank you. Did you so I, I put the question, and, and there's sort of two parts to it, and, and one part you know, kind of got lost in the small word count uh, on, on, on platform. Um, and the, I mean, I, I'm inclined to the view that if a country has a tech minister by whatever title, that person should be a diplomat. <laughs> As in quite, quite literally your job if you're the ICT minister should be to travel and, and work in, in, in conjunction with foreign ministry. Um, but the, the second part of the question comes to the, to what extent should, no, it's not mine. Uh, to what extent should the, the tech, um, you know, diplomacy involve the non-government sector involve, you know, to what extent, so if you, you know, if you consider the UK, a lot of its tech diplomacy at the moment is done by things like London Tech Advocates, and it, it's sort of outsourced, and, and, you know, there is an extent to which, again, let, let me pick on the UK because <laughs> it's the Tony Blair Institute, but, you know, a particular government might, might, might have some difficulty in, in breaking certain barriers because of unpopular policies, a particular political party can be very unpopular and their, their predecessors could, could, could be more popular. Um, but the NGO sector often has credibility and, I mean, you know, well-managed diplomacy has the sense of separation of state and, and government. And, but in the tech sector and in a fast-moving new industry, that sort of institutional mechanism does not yet exist. And, and my sort of fear is if countries adopt the, the approach of, okay, well, we're going to appoint five people as, you know, diplomats, we're going to, you know, give them diplomatic power and we're going to send them abroad as tech diplomats, um, they won't have the necessary credibility. And, and you need to build that in, in various shapes and forms and, and work in a slightly different way than how you, you've traditionally done it. So, yeah, so that, that's kind of the, the double nudge of in government, where should it be? And I, I, I very strongly agree it should be foreign affairs. And if there is a tech ministry, it should work very, very much in conjunction. Um, but secondly, to what extent, with the culture and with the way things are, is government a little bit more impotent than it really would like to be um, to actually do things? Thank you very much. I believe Andre wants to come back into the conversation. Andre? Oh, here we go. Thank you. Uh, I apologize. I got disconnected. Uh, uh, yes, yes. Um, so I, I did miss part of your question, and I, I, I do apologize because I, I, I got disconnected. So I hope I'm not contradicting you or, or, or somehow answering a different question. Um, but but there is there's a very interesting uh, point to be made here about you know the extent the extent to which this uh, this kind of um, philosophy should be embedded within foreign policy and within 
country's foreign policy rather than, for example, the um, in industry. Now, I'm kind of leaving NGOs and civil society uh, aside because uh, for me, they're kind of part of the uh, national or government package in, in, in this context. I'll explain myself in a second. Um, but for me, perhaps the, the, best, uh, the best way to, to answer this question is to kind of look at, look at, look at a specific example um, and, and see how, um, how I feel that tech diplomacy has allowed countries, in this case the EU actually, so an entire bloc, to, to negotiate with, uh, with the tech giants a deal which is much significantly better for their citizens. And here I'm talking about GDPR, which obviously many, many, many companies hate, but it's basically how the EU has, assure, uh, has helped its citizens' data be, uh, be, be safeguarded. And this is something which um, it's not an optional tool. I mean, every, every multinational digital tech company that needs to operate in the EU has to abide by the GDPR. Um, but it is only by... Uh, by having national and supranational entities like the EU kind of discussing with their citizens and showing them you know, how high the stakes are, how, how important it is to, for example, safeguard your data, that then would give the citizens the power to push back against tech giants and say, listen, we want our data to be safeguarded. We want our data to be, to be held safe. We don't want our, our data to be sold to every, every, any other third party, uh, third party that you, you, know, you would like to, you, to, to, sell, to sell data to. And this has allowed, as I said, to, the, 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 the block to improve its citizens' digital lives um, in, in a way which wouldn't have otherwise happened, in my opinion. So if, if, if we left uh, this negotiation or this discussion to the tech industry, obviously the tech industry would have not made such a big deal of it because it is, it is quite simply more expensive to deal with things this way. And, and citizens would have not perhaps been as involved and the outcry would have not perhaps been as, as strong and therefore things would have not progressed in, a, in, in, this, in this positive way. So I do see, uh, in this very specific aspect of governance at least, I do see a very vital role for governments and national governments and supranational governments to play uh, when it comes to dealing with the tech giants. So here it's kind of uh, diplomacy uh, for governing tech, so diplomacy for tech uh, in, my, in my nomenclature. Um, so yeah, so I just wanted to add this as, as a part answer to, to some of this question. But again, I apologize, I did get disconnected, so I might have missed uh, the rest of your intervention. So uh, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> It was absolutely perfect, Anjay. You did really help bring a lot of clarity. Um, I want to come back to Jeldon. I think I'm going to put two questions together as we're running out of time uh, a little bit. Uh, but I'll go back to Jeldon and then possibly to Sunit on this. But uh, we have one question about, do you worry about the fragmented status of digital policy in Africa as a risk for Africa to become a strong player in the global tech uh, geopolitics? And um, by the same token, um, what do you see the top issues of current tech diplomatic efforts? So is that data governance? Is it AI? Is it cyber? Uh, we'd love to have your thoughts on that, Dowder. Thought. <laughs> Thank you, Fanny. Yeah, all good. Can you hear me? Yes, uh, it's a very interesting question, uh, Melanie. Um, but I think to be um, so, Senegal, Senegal is now uh, the um, we are chairing the un um, African Union, um, and I know that there is a lot going on on the continental side of things. So. We are trying, I think, to be uh, to consolidate um, not only the policies, the regulations, but again to align on uh, the kind of interest that uh, we have on uh, making sure that as Africans we are moving in the same, you know, we, we are having the same um, vision and uh, we are executing on on on, on this thing. But again, the fact that there is um uh different regime let's call it that way uh with uh, some kind of um uh, uh, uh 
uh, countries uh, leaning through, you know, uh, Russia is playing a, a big role uh, in Mali, for instance, while uh, you have, you know, China all over. So there is, uh, I think that Sinit uh, talked about it uh, earlier, which is that, that fragmentation will come from, you know, uh, superpower play, having Africa at their playing field. So uh, uh, last year when we were at the FTF and then we talked about the uh, new IP uh, or, uh, that China is trying to push. And uh, uh, so I think... Uh, we are being more and more aware of what's being uh, what is playing on on the geopolitical side of things. Uh, we understand it, but for now, uh, I think there is some kind of uh, pragmatism for um, the, the country like Senegal, where we say, okay, if uh, we have a good offer of Huawei building the physical infrastructure, no problem, and then we try to assess it and have other you know other local tech or big tech coming in and and then play uh, and push and, and putting their their hardware or their software so we're trying to be pragmatic um for now because i think that this tech diplomacy for senegal for instance, is again uh, around uh, fdi how how we can solve our youth employment so uh, the approach is very economical uh, and being le led by the, the the president, so that fragmentation we have it in the back of our head. But what is now very, what we are focusing on is how we can use the tech di tech diplomacy to, you know, push the economical agenda. So that's where we are at for now. Thank you so much, uh, Sini. Thanks, Melanie. Um, so I'll speak in terms of my view on what the kind of three big issues um, where tech diplomacy can play an important role at, at a kind of pan-African level. So the first one is digital ID. Like the lack of ID is just a fundamental barrier to so many people um, and also for kind of governments to manage and, and s be in service uh, of their populations. So digital ID is one, um, it has to be interoperable, it has to operate internationally, it has to be respected not just on, on the continent but globally. Um, secondly is uh, peace and security. Um, so I, I, would, I don't want that to boil down to kind of cyber security and tech warfare, although those are important dimensions. But I think moving beyond um, the role of tech in war, but actually the, ro the role of that tech can play in promoting peace, in promoting understanding. So that speaks to your earlier point around e-diplomacy um, and understanding the importance of managing and, and protecting the narrative, um, particularly toxic narratives that feed, that feed, that feed war and conflict um, across the continent. So digital ID first, peace and security second. And then the final one is, um, leveraging the digital economy for what I would describe as productive and dignified employment. Unemployment across the continent is a major problem, and I think people f lacking a sense of optimism about their future and their future role uh, in terms of the direction of travel, um, and I don't think that's specific to Africa. Um, I, think <laughs> I think, dare I say, Brexit might be an example of <laughs> certain communities feeling like they don't, they, they don't have a right and they, they, they're not featured in what the future looks like. Um, so, I would, so for me, the three major areas um, where I see tech diplomacy being a powerful force is digital ID, peace and security, um, and dignified employment in the digital economy. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, we are nearly at time. Um, so the question actually on Slido with the most likes at the moment is the question of Meta and Cicero and to the extent that can a machine learning process do diplomacy better than us or to the extent that it can be used as a tool. Uh, I have my personal thoughts about this, uh, both an academic that teaches international conflict resolution and security, as well as someone that teaches international negotiation and that works uh, in this. And I absolutely use all sorts of tools uh, on this, but I'm going to throw it open to the room before I have my say. Does anybody want to give their pennies worth on Meta and Cicero at the moment? 
Bad idea. Why? <laughs> Question. It can be used as a tool for the non-diplomatic. <laughs> uh, anyone else want to have their thought? Everyone's gone shy. Everyone's gone shy. Uh, Are you going to? <laughs> quick, quick. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Did I interrupt someone? Yes, of course. Um, sorry, okay, I thought I interrupted someone. No, I mean, I, 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 I agree. I think with the. Spirit with the with the with the spirit that there is in the in the room at the moment, as far as I could gather. Um, my my personal opinion is, uh, you know, things like this are always always a tool which might have some applicability. And uh, there is perhaps one direct thing which I could I could speak to. You know, um, one of the uh, interesting ways of approaching any dispute is kind of uh, you know, so one of the cardinal rules is separate the people from the problem. You know, separate the states from the problem and, and try and think about kind of the objective issues at hand. Perhaps there could be a, a, a space for electronic tools to help us do that. Perhaps you know, see certain things a bit more objectively. But then beyond that, I, I, I would be scared of, of, <laughs> of giving them any leeway. Um, uh, having said that, you know, this is a very, very interesting, important topic. And I know that at least the Swiss Ministry of Foreign Affairs is, is commissioning a study on this point, uh, which would be interesting to see if it, um, even when it's published. Uh, but yes, I think I do agree with the spirit that perhaps there is a place for these things. Not quite in high stakes diplomacy, though. <laughs> and that's just a sort of my sort of opinion on it, <laughs> for what it's worth. Um, and as I say, I love gaming. I use all sorts of tools, particularly in my teaching of negotiation. And I've even spent some time uh, with students in virtual reality platforms using seeing do people negotiate better as an avatar or not? And, you know, does it help them overcome different barriers when they're an avatar? Um, I'd say, like Andre, I think these things can be really useful tools. I think they could be u useful tools for stress testing ideas, but the basic art of diplomacy and relationship building and understanding really what people's interests are that aren't always expressed is not something that I think machine learning has quite been able to uncover yet. So you often get, and people send me all the time different types of machine learning tools where I've had one presented to me, it's like, this one can solve the Ukraine crisis. Like, look at it. <laughs> like, and then I look at the caveat, and it's like, you know, this is a tool, it's like, in the hands of a skilled mediator. And <laughs> I think, you know, the, like, the postscript there is like, yes, most things in the hands of a skilled mediator <laughs> can be helpful, which is why we need more skilled tech mediators and more skilled tech diplomats and uh, thinking about what we need to do to enable that both as organizations, as communities, as governments, as academics, as where we can and where countries can come to us, whether it's organizations like SEPs or myself with that TBI, of where they can come to and say, you know, what can we do to help build this? I know there's programs in the US that are going in and upskilling foreign policy um, or the foreign ministry, State Department, like, and teaching uh, diplomats there, got a, what is a hypersonic missile? Just what is it? What's the technology? What is it? And what's the conversation around it? So sometimes just opening up this conversation and upskilling and giving the tools to be able to engage across the full range of the tech ecosystem. Um, I think that that brings us to time. Um, do any of our speakers have any parting comments, Sineep? I'll just say one thing. I'm the metaverse, your, your question, I think it's a good one. I think an interesting thought experiment would be, um, particularly in diplomacy, we know that who you are, where you come from, your accent kind of already projects a certain position. And I think kind of, I wonder if virtual spaces would, are, would be quite interesting spaces to enable greater inclusion, I guess, and greater neutrality. Um, I also think they allow a kind of more egalitarian voice, potentially. Um, and I'm particularly keen on uh,
text virtual spaces being used for inclusion in terms of people with disabilities and and all of those things that kind of make us judge people and judge their positions early on. So, like everyone else, I agree. There's a tool. I think. I think. Um, I think at the end of the day, where we are, um, we still want to shake people's hands and look them in the eye, right? Like I think that's. <laughs> I think that's probably still true. So that will be my parting comment. Thank you, everyone. I just want to add that. <laughs> uh, just, uh, we're not going <laughs> to. No, but the interesting thing, and I don't know if anyone else has done any work on the metaverse, but when I was doing work on negotiation in the metaverse, or just for anyone that's interested in this, is that point was really interesting in the fact that there's something called the Proteus effect about how people choose to represent themselves in the metaverse. And if you go into sort of the ones where you build an avatar, it was really interesting. People who were, had disabilities, for instance, still choose to represent themselves with those disabilities in the metaverse rather than, so people still were building themselves in wheelchairs and still rather than, I can walk in the metaverse. And so I think that's really yeah. interesting. Not that it negates, <laughs> but I just think it's the interesting postscript. So tech has still has lots of to offer as teaching tools, maybe as solution tools. And um, we hope um, that you found the conversation interesting. I want to take a huge thanks to our speakers that joined us from afar, to uh, Andre, uh, to Dalda, to Andrea, who I hope will listen to this in recording at some point. I wish he was here to give us a Latin American uh, perspective, but please do look up his work. I'm sure he would love to share it, or maybe we can reopen the conversation to Sunit to Rosanna, to Natalia at the back there that's been feeding us all the questions and to all of you for staying, as I say, at the end of a long day. Uh, thank you for making this a super interesting conversation. Thank you so much.